Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. My name is Marko Finnik and I will be presenting today. I work as a director of advanced threat protection in F-Secure. I've been working for the past five years in multiple initiatives where we bring out new set of technologies and services, especially for company environments. During the past two years, we've been focusing on bringing out a new set of technologies, especially meant to catch advanced human attackers. And that will be on our agenda today. A few practical matters. A recorded version of this webinar will be available afterwards. And we'd absolutely love to hear from you. So if you have any comments, feel free to post them online. And there will be Q&A in the end. As a reminder, we are running a series of webinars touching each major area of the holistic 360 view in the cybersecurity, consisting of four main areas, where we focus on prediction, prevention, detection, which is on the agenda today, and also the response. And finally, there's the gray layer on, on top of all of these areas. And this refers to requirement of proper management of the whole 360 cybersecurity. And we have actually run already two webinars, so if you haven't checked those out, feel free to do so. Uh, you'll find them from our Business Security Insider web pages. About the agenda today, so I will be briefly talking about threat landscape and what's interesting in there. What's happening in the company is highlighting a few trends. Then talking about the attacker mindset, approach to detection. Uh, how attackers operate, and then I'm going to make a few deep dives into the detection technologies and especially focusing on the demystifying of machine learning because it seems to be the kind of the real unicorn in the market today. Then I'm going to explain the man and machine approach which is required and I'm going to give you lots of tips for instance what to measure and ending with do's and don'ts and of course the questions and answers. And what can you expect from this? So if you happen to be a techie, I will give you quite a lot of pointers to what actually look after when you are building yourself a detection and response capabilities. And if you happen to be a chief information security officer, I will be giving a lot of tips for you as well. So let's start by looking what's happening on the threat landscape. What is really interesting from our point of view, and it should be interesting for you as well. We see a lot of new APT discoveries, and APT is a sort for advanced persistent threat. We do see new nation state activities as well as criminals. I think most of these are actually criminally introduced attacks, but we still see quite a lot of nation state activities as well. And those who don't know the news F secure, we actually do more real criminal investigations in Europe than anybody else. And we do a lot of incident response cases. So I will be dropping quite a lot of tips what to look for. Uh, we see spear phishing campaigns on the rise. This is still the most typical way for you to get uh, hacked. Uh, we do see increase in zero days. But that's kind of a reminder is that zero days is not your primary problem. The primary problem is the existing vulnerabilities where you already have a patch available because these are the ones that most probably are going to get you hacked. But we do see more zero days and the life cycle for one zero day is getting shorter and shorter. When it comes to exploit kits, uh, roughly 75% of the legit websites are at risk so they run, they run vulnerable software. Uh, why does it matter for advanced threats? Because this can be used as a stepping stone for instance, to launch attack against your organization by utilizing that legit website as the stepping stone. And most of the internet spam today is ransomware. So as a kind of comforting thought, if you are seeing a lot of ransomware and if it's a nuisance for you, well, it's nuisance for everybody else. And the only way that this is going to go away is that we somehow manage to remove the financial kind of uh, goal that the attackers have when they launch this ransomware campaigns. And I'm not seeing that going away anytime soon. So what's happening in the companies? Just highlighting a few key trends. Uh, this is what Gartner is predicting. So the, by 2020, 60% of the information security budget will be allocated to rapid detection and response approaches. And this is actually something that we see as well quite a lot. 
So there simply ain't that many consoles in base in organizations today to actually see when and if something slips past the preventive layers. And in Europe, of course, we have preparations for the general data protection regulation. And by the way, if you would like us to discuss about this more, because we have been following this very closely, put us a comment and we will most probably run a webinar about this. So what, is, what does it mean for you inside the companies? So let us know. But all right, let's start our deep dive by first understanding the attacker mindset. The attacker, when they go after your company, they have a goal. They are goal oriented and they will choose the path of least resistance. And if you first start by looking at cloud, I think this will be a kind of interesting topic for you, especially in the future, because I know that many of the organizations today, yours included, will be digitalizing their customer facing services and investing into these cloud services a lot more in the future. And the number one thing is that the identity is or has already become the new attack surface. So whether we talk about targeting the company directly by, for instance, trying to fish the usernames and passwords for the administrators or attacking the end users for fraud. But this happens a lot and phishing is the most common way of this happening. Uh, there are also other targets that the attackers include. Uh, the number one is application level vulnerabilities and exploiting those, encryption, SSH keys and certificates, and this kind of go hand in hand. Uh, one of the emerging area that you may want to check is the user and entity behavior analytics. And I actually have a link in the end. Uh, today, I will be mostly focusing on the Intel and Epic, but I kind of recognize that most of you are already purchasing, for instance, infrastructure as a service. So this kind of applies also for the cloud as well. So the most common ways for you to get hacked is via phishing and exploit. That's the kind of the path of the least resistance. And we do see quite a lot of single shot attacks. Ransomware is a good example, but we do also see a lot of persistent attacks. And one of the common denominators in these are the use of common system internals like PowerShell, Windows management instrumentation, service commands and so forth. The use of common remote admin tools or RATS and hacking tools like Orcus, Light Manager, Luminosity Link and Mimikatz. And if you think that, okay, well, we have network based IDS, so we only <laughs> need to um, detect the command and control traffic. So these are getting more and more clever. For instance, hiding inside Office 365, Gmail, HTTPS and so forth. And it's getting more and more tricky to actually detect this from the network level only. And one tip, look especially at non-malware techniques and internal network traffic. So let's start by looking at how the attackers operate and what they are after. Like I mentioned, the goals are very clear. So what do they actually want to achieve? And this we can put in the two different categories, whether the attacker is after data or they are after controlling a certain uh, critical capabilities. And this can be actually that if you talk about the data, it can be customer data, emails, intellectual property, and so forth. Just to give you a one tip if in here, if I would go after your data, now would I directly go after your servers to get the data? Well, most likely not. So what every company have, which is in common, is that you take backups. The que direct question to you is that how many do you actually know and can trust the security of your backups. Just to kind of give you the first tip in here. It might be that the attacker is after the control of certain capabilities. The good example is the Swift attacks, gaining access to money transfer systems, which tend to be normal PCs, ATMs, energy grids, IoT. Well, it, it will be the big thing in the future, especially using IoTs as to gain the initial foothold in the system. And ransomware is a good example as well. But what is actually very important to understand is that how does this actually happen? So how does a successful advanced attack happen? It usually starts with sphere phishing campaign. You use document with uh, PowerShell payload or you might utilize an exploit kit. When the link is clicked, 
and then establish persistence by dropping a simple remote cell backdoor or you might actually go for the remote administration tool approach. Use system internals for lateral movement, hacking tools to dump passwords when hunting for admin accounts once the attacker has admin accounts. Then it's basically game over for the defender and usually during that point they are already accessing the data or taking control of the critical capabilities. And the most critical thing in here to understand is the moment when the attacker gains the initial foothold. And there are again three very important things to look after. Like I mentioned, user credentials, identity being the new attack surface. Uh, and one tip in here is that make sure that what, whenever this happens, because it will happen, the attacker cannot, for instance, dump your whole customer database. So start by making this more difficult, for instance, using proper two-factor authentication always and so forth, especially for the critical accounts. Then you want to look at operating environment, especially the initial moment when the attacker sneaks in the back door, uses the remote cell, uses malware to elevate to or from user to admin and so on. And it's very well known that all of these activities of course happen at the endpoint. Then we of course have the low level operating system, more exotic attacks like bad USB, tampering BIOS firmware and all forms of rootkits. But to give you some tips what to look for. So think about the attacker when they are doing something inside your system, they're going to leave footprints. And you, there are five different areas that you want to look at. You want to look for user level footprints. You want to look at what happens in the application level because malware is just an application. So is backdoor and so is for instance remote administration tools. You want to look what happens in the network level and especially internal network traffic. And then what happens in the operating environment, like I mentioned, system internals, remote IT, IT admin tools, and then also the lower level. So you want to actually check that how much visibility do you actually have today when it comes to these activities and start from there. Now, if you take a look at the detection technology, we can roughly put this into two different categories. Uh, number one is that where we find known badness. And number two is where we find unknown patterns. So something that we don't even know what to look for. And if I start from the category number one, is that it, we look for known bad behavior. And this can be malware and it can actually be non-malware. So we can look at both. And one common examples are the expert systems. And this is actually something that we have mastered for a long period of time. And a common way to apply this is behavioral rule engines. We have IOCs, indicators of compromise and symbol signatures. And then you can always ask, okay, is signatures dead? Well, I would say that if you primarily use them for detection, then it's dead. But there are many other ways that you can actually utilize it. Good example is that if we drop a sensor to an endpoint, what we actually do is what we call reverse whitelisting. So we use our signature database and we can immediately kind of rule out 99.9 something percent of the clean files from that system. So if there happens to be a rat, a potentially unwanted program hiding there, if it's a file-based malware, it will sign like a Christmas tree. So there's still quite a lot of uses for signatures and file hashes. Uh, then we have the second category where we actually find unknown badness. So something that we don't even know. And we find this by looking at deviances from any known good behavior. And again, this can be malware or non-malware. And examples are machine learning or ML, and then statistical modeling. Uh, tip in here for the audience. Uh, question that I get asked a lot is why not to invest to blocking technologies only, and why to use reactive technology and approach for detection and response. Now, if you go against advanced attacker, they would get immediate feedback whether or not they are successfully gaining initial foothold and you're kind of giving this initial feedback. Uh, we've seen examples where the attacker has used for instance multiple backdoor and some clever A-B testing for sphere phishing where we can in initially see that okay the first backdoor was removed, the second backdoor was removed but the third one was not and it was successfully 
or it was successful when it beaconed back home and then we later on went and uh, did some uh, recovery afterwards. But the breach had already happened. But the more fundamental reason is the following. I mean, if you rely on preventive measures, you as a defender need to be right 100% of the time, while the attacker needs to be right only once. And like I mentioned, it's actually pretty easy because you get the initial feedback and you get it right away. If you rely on reactive detection, the attacker needs to be right 100% of the time and you as the defender need to be right only once and you're not giving that initial feedback or immediate feedback. And usually it's actually a pretty good idea to learn a bit more about the attacker than just the initial backdoor. So I'm going to now make a deep dive to machine learning because there is so much marketing happening in the market and the machine learning something it, it sometimes feels like it's the real cybersecurity unicorn. It's the kind of the one trick that will solve all the problems. So I wanted to make a bit of a deep dive just to kind of give you understanding how it actually works. Uh, we've been using machine learning in various forms for over 10 years. Uh, there is basically two different machine learning ways. One is supervised machine learning where you basically train the program on a predefined set of training examples, which then facilitates its ability to reach an accurate conclusion when given new data. So think about it as you have a set of data, which is the training set. Then you have feature extraction. So you extract the things that you are interested in. Then you turn it through the machine learning algorithm and you either directly get some form of anomaly detection results or you want to apply, for instance, clustering and grouping of the object and then take a look at those further. And then, of course, there is the unsupervised machine learning, but I'm not going to go into details with that thing. Uh, one thing which is important to understand is the confidence score. The end result is not a binary yes or no. And we need to set a decision making threshold to define whether something is malicious or not. So what this actually means is I'm going to show you an example. Uh, this is one of the machine learning algorithms that we use. We call it principal component analysis. So if you want to make a further analysis of how it actually works, you can do so. But this is just a sample data set. And what you can actually see in here are a few clear trends. And if we put the decision threshold in the, in the very center, you can see that from the decision point to the right, everything gets detected as malicious, but you can immediately see that there is one false positive there. But the more worrying thing is that the things that are left on the, on the left side, which are detected as benign, and there are quite many samples that we have actually missed. And the range that we actually want to analyze further in this case is the range from minus 0 0.4 to 0 0.3. So we want to look for a bit wider range so we don't want, simply want to rely on machine learning only. And I will come back to this a bit later on. So how do we actually do it? Uh, one topic that I want to touch, and this is a kind of tip for you to take away from this presentation, is that the quality of the data is absolutely the most important factor to applying machine learning. And of course, you can say that there is even more important thing, the availability of the data in the first place. So ML does not find all anomalies from your network. It solely depends on the availability of the good quality data. And the most common issue that I see is that many try to look for anomalies from log data. Uh, the issue with this is that the data is not exactly high quality. And most importantly, most of the critical data is missing in the first place. So what happens in the end is that in order to make some sense out of this, the ML algorithms that are actually applied to the very limited data sets, thus giving you a poor detection coverage. And I have to say that I, as if I would be you, I would be really skeptical for any solutions sold on top of log collection analysis systems. At least you want to ask, what is the data that you process? Because from that you already know what can it detect. So as an example, how do we actually utilize machine learning to detect advanced threat actors? And this is really the needle in a haystack analysis. So we start by applying machine learning because it's really an efficient way to raise anomalies from baseline. 
but we don't trust the machine learning only. And the next step what we do is what we call auto forensics functions. And this might be for instance statistical baseline analytics so kind of heavy processing. And the goal on here is to help the threat analysts to qualify the end result as benign or malicious. And then as a third step we actually have humans who know how the attackers think and then can qualify the case as an incident and then most importantly start immediate containment activities. And if I expand this a bit, so we use multiple different detection technologies as an efficient way to raise the anomalies. So we look for known badness but we also look for unknown badness. So it's kind of a combination of, of each, of both. And then we have a lot of auto forensics technologies to help to qualify the results as a benign or malicious. Just to give you one example, so what do we actually mean? So let's assume that we would get from a network sensor a detection that there is a connection to known bad IP address. So what the auto forensics does, it collects the information that okay it was this host, in this host there was a process that did the connection and what were the behaviors before that. Just to make sure that the threat analysts have the information to make that cl quick classification and then immediately start the containment actions. And then of course on top of that you need to count in also the incident responders to lead the critical incident process to make sure that you have the process in place and then the remediation efforts and aftermath. And as a key takeaway it is actually the time it takes from detection to response where the components fail today. And I will actually come back to this a bit later on. So as a tip, when making a decision which solution to use for detection, focus especially on the quality of the detection and all the relevant in intelligence your threat analyst will need in order to make the quick decision and start the immediate containment activities because the clock is ticking. Like I said, this time is absolutely critical. And then let's do some do's and don'ts. The first don't is don't rely on preventive measures. I know this is like me preaching to a choir, but still skilled attackers will get through your preventive measures. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Like I said, uh, we actually do white hat hacking as well. So we do a lot of red team in penetration testing to our customers. And I have to say that it's surprisingly easy to breach the preventive measures and on the other hand we do quite a lot of real crime scene investigations so we actually see this happening on the day-to-day -day basis. So it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when and it's not even that difficult to be honest. Uh, don't rely on single detection technology. There really is no unicorns. Don't go to a vendor and ask do you do machine learning and if they say yes then you feel that oh, I'm so relieved now we have all the problems so that's not gonna happen. Uh, best combination is to apply multiple detection technologies and especially focusing on making the decision making easy for the threat analysts who are the guys who need to do the remediation activities in the end. And remember you need man and machine to be able to detect advanced threats and it's not just about detection it's about the response part. So always take that into account and actually measure the time it takes from detection to response. Uh, this is a long one. Don't rely on single point of detection, it's the only network. Uh, most companies where we actually go we see that they have network based IDS, there are few common issues. Uh, well you know that it's really easy to hide and remain undetected. You might use traffic fragmentation, tunneling via known good protocols. I mentioned using Gmail as a command and console, etc., etc., etc. So there are so many different ways to hide the traffic. Uh, the one of the common issues as well is that most solutions actually look at the edge traffic, but they don't look at the internal network traffic. For instance, you can't see lateral movement. That's a big, big issue. And if you think about in the future, I think most of the traffic eventually will be encrypted. For instance, HTTP2 on default uses crypto. And then again, even if you get a detection, it's 
originated from an endpoint, which basically means that you immediately need to get visibility to what actually happened in that endpoint. So you're going to have to have that endpoint visibility in the end anyway. And as a kind of closing thought, uh, we were actually thinking that, okay, what are the most common issues with the idea systems and how they have, how they are run today? And we kind of came into the conclusion that the most fundamental issue is that we actually need never seen a well-maintained idea system. Uh, then some do, so what are the recommendations that we would give to you? Is start by building a good sensor detection coverage. So having good detection coverage to both endpoint and network, and especially the ability to cross-reference between these two. So you, if you see a connection going to the suspicious IP address, what happened in the endpoint and vice versa. Uh, focus also on the retention of the data. Uh, especially you want to keep the data for a long period of time and you want to have detection capabilities for the old data. Good example is that if someone else inside your vertical, let's say banking gets targeted, you want to look for signs that whether you have targeted, been targeted as well, or if you actually have a breach ongoing. So you want to retain the data. And it always helps if you have to go back for any reasons to do any type of investigation so that you actually have the data. And it actually makes the machine learning uh, better as well, as well as the statistical analytics. And if you need to make a choice, start from the endpoints. I know many of you don't like agents. That's okay, but you absolutely have to have good visibility to the endpoints. It, it doesn't really matter. But if you cannot deploy agents, start from network. As long as you start, then that's okay. And as a kind of last thought, look at deception, HoneyNet's ETC as a kind of emerging alternative. I know many of us have been deploying honeypots for like 15 years, but there are some cool developments in here as well. And I put some links to the end. Uh, do measure your detection and response capabilities by going against a skilled attacker. Uh, many companies have asked for me that, okay, how do we actually know that if we are selecting ourselves a vendor or managed security service provider, that are they any good? So what is in the SLA that we need to look for? And I'm like, they, there is really no SLA that can give you the answers. The only way that for you to know for sure is, you, is that you go against a real advanced adversary. So do utilize skilled red teams and penetration testing companies and do so that you don't even know about it. And many times uh, I get the comment that why would I want to do this? Because it's kind of proving to my boss that I'm not doing my job properly. But think about it, this is kind of uh, a way for you to utilize, to convince the budget holders that you actually have to do something about it because you know what the problem is. And it's a lot worse that you actually don't know how good your detection capabilities are, or whether you have processes in place to properly contain when you go against skilled adversary. So it's better to know than not know, believe me. We've been in quite many companies who have taken the route of not knowing and then they've been hacked. So that's not a pleasant place to be, especially in the future because of the GDPR. And the last thing that I absolutely want to you to take away from this webinar. So the most important thing, measure the time from detection to response. Now this is where the companies fail today. This is where it comes from when you go to the web and you see that, okay, it looks, it looks like it takes like plus 200 days for the companies to actually detect a breach. And in many cases, the eventual notification that there was a breach come from external sources. And it does not really matter how good your detection solutions are if you don't have the skilled people available 24 seven to contain and remediate. And as a kind of guiding principle, start by knowing your baseline. And this actually maps to the previous slide. So figure out where you are today when it comes to detection capabilities and then measure your current capability and then start setting improvement goals. Improve step by step 
or you might want to look for managed solutions. And the end goal should be something which is less than 30 minutes. And the reason why this is so important is that you need to figure out what is the time that it takes for the attacker to gain access to the critical data or capabilities that you have, which are most commonly their calls for if they will ever target your company. And how much time will it take for the attack to gain access to there? And then set that time. And as a further reading, I put some links which are beneficial. And now it's time for the Q&A. All right. So it appears there's no questions, which is, of course, excellent. A uh, few reminders. So the recording will be available. So if you joined during the presentation and you want to reverse to some other topics, so you will get a notification once the recording is available. And just a reminder that the next uh, webinar in this series will be about the response coming shortly after this one. So we are hoping to see you there. So thank for joining and we are closing and wrapping up the session.